so grateful to John to be here tonight to talk about his book and grateful to uh, his friend Mark, who is also a Dover boy for joining us. Mark is gonna introduce John and speak a little bit about the Armenian side of um, John's book. Um, and I just wanted to ask everybody to, um, if you are able at the very end of the program, you'll get, when you leave the meeting, you'll get popped into a, a survey um, about the program. So if you have just a couple of seconds to just quickly let us know what you liked, didn't like, what you'd like to see in the future as far as programming from the library virtually. Um, and we also are curious where you heard about this program. So uh, stay on the line as it were after the program and take a second to answer the survey and it, that's appreciated by us. Um, if you have questions for John or Mark, you can type them into chat and John will um, see those and respond to those at the end. Um, a nice message from Nancy Boyle. Hi, Nancy. Nancy and I go to church together. No. Um, all right, so I'm going to throw it over to you, Mark. Okay, thanks, Susan. Mm -hmm. Well, good evening, everybody. Uh, it's an honor to be here with you tonight. Uh, I only wish we could all be together uh, at the Dover Public Library where uh, I spent so many hours of my life and I think uh, where John spent so many hours of his life, um, many of them I'm sure productive. And uh, about a year and a half ago, I saw a piece online written by John Christie on the WBUR website commemorating the anniversary of the Armenian Genocide and indicating that he was working on a memoir. So I immediately sent the link to my mother, uh, who, who lives in Dover still, uh, and confirmed with her that John was in fact the son of Kay Banyan Christie, who I remember very well, and who had in fact bab babysat my mother uh, way back when in the day. I emailed John and not long afterwards, he and I got together down here uh, in Massachusetts at my office. One thing I knew when I read John's wonderful book, and in fact, maybe even before I actually read the book, uh, was that we had to do an event at the Dover Public Library. <laughs> uh, for the past 22 years that I've worked for the National Association for Armenian Studies and Research, which is based in Belmont, Mass., uh, and where I'm the Director of Academic Affairs. I've helped organize hundreds of lectures and other public programs in the Boston area and around the US. Most of them, uh, although not all of them, take place in areas like Greater Boston, Southern California, New York, and New Jersey, and other areas where there's a significant Armenian population. Needless to say, perhaps, despite being my hometown and John's hometown, Dover is not on the radar for things Armenian. And I have a special interest in the early history of the Armenian American community, perhaps because uh, it's still something that's not all that well documented in many respects. My earliest ancestor to immigrate to the United States, one of my great grandfathers, arrived in America in 1888, although not in Dover, uh, which is pretty early for the Armenians in this country. At that time, there were only a few hundred Armenians in the US altogether increased during the 1890s and early 1900s. I've looked a little bit into the history, such as it is, of Armenians in Dover. Looking at the 1900 census, I've found a handful of Armenians listed, working industrial jobs. By, 19, by 1910, I could find a total of 36 out of a total population at that time of about 13,000 in Dover. That's pretty small. But by the time my grandparents moved to Dover in the 1930s, there were fewer than that. And among them were the Banyan family who had settled in Dover, I don't know exactly when, but, but by 1920 anyway. And by the time I was growing up in the, in the 70s, uh, there were even fewer than that, just a handful really, including still the Banyan family, which meant that an inordinate amount of my childhood was spent explaining to classmates and teachers what an Armenian was. So for me, 
the fact that one of those rarer than hen's teeth Dover Armenians, John Christie, and I know John is half Armenian, but that makes no difference. He's, he's all Armenian, uh, just the same. A talented writer and acclaimed journalist has written a book about growing up in Dover and growing up the grandson of a, of a survivor of the Armenian genocide, like me, and has done so with such vividness is truly amazing and wonderful and a cause for celebration. And I'm so proud of the work he's done and for the chance to speak to you here tonight and now to introduce John. John is an award-winning veteran journalist who has worked as a reporter, editor, and publisher for newspapers in Massachusetts, Florida, and Maine. In Dover, he attended St. Mary Academy, St. Thomas Aquinas High School, and the University of New Hampshire. He is the editor of the bestseller, Andrew, Savagery from the Sea, and his work has appeared in the Boston Globe, Boston Magazine, Yankee Magazine, the Boston Phoenix, NPR, online and elsewhere. And with his wife, Naomi Shallot, he founded the investigative news service, the main center for public interest reporting. I can't encourage you enough to check out John's book, The Prince of Wentworth Street, An American Boyhood, boyhood in the Shadow of Genocide. It's a wonderful book and you don't have to be Armenian to enjoy it. Although if you are Armenian, you'll really enjoy it. Maybe even that much more. John. No, oh, thanks, Mark, and thanks, Susan, for setting this up. And Mark, thanks for that great story. I really was very lucky to, to meet you through this and become a friend with you and, and to meet your mother and talk to your mother about our families and how they used to get together, including a video uh, they had of my mother when she was about 19 at a Halloween party at Mark's family's home. It's been priceless to my family to see that. Um, and like, like Mark, I did spend a lot of time at that library. I probably spent more time playing ball and at the library, I should have been more time at the library, but I did tell you quite a bit. And I went there often to research the book. There's a lot of, there's a great uh, a room, on the second floor with a lot of Dover information in it that I, I gleaned uh, much from there. So I appreciate the library in, a lot, in lots of ways. But let's get to the book. Uh, I'll be reading from a few chapters, excerpts from those chapters, and not a complete chapter, just so you can get a flavor of different parts of the book. And I'll start with chapter three, which is titled The Killing the Kafir, and I'll explain that word in a minute. This chapter is based on a tape recording that my grandmother made with my cousin. My grandmother was a survivor of the Indian genocide, and her name was Rose Banyan. I grew up at a tenement next door to her on Wentworth Street, now called Boyle Street, just off Court Street. Her Armenian name was Galenia Hosepian. You need to know that as we hear this chapter. Chapter three, called The Killing the Kafir. When my Nana speaks into the tape recorder, the year is 1990, and she is 91 years old. But her heart travels back to 1909, to a spring day in Swedia, a Turkish district close enough to the Mediterranean that on that, on that day, it is likely that a sea breeze ruffled the mulberry trees that grew everywhere in the hills. Her mother is sent her to move the family's cows to a field where a shepherd was to watch over them. Nana says in the tape recorder, I was barefooted in getting them out of the stall and chased them down the garden to the brook. I almost see the brook now, and they were grazing, and I was coming back to the mulberry trees, and the mulberry trees were tapping my face, and I was running, and I was a kid, and I hadn't eaten anything yet, nothing. Then a boy, a Turkish boy, hollers to me. I never forget it, never could forget it. In Turkish, he says, they're killing the kafir. You know, they call us kafir. You know what that means? Well, it's a bad word. They want to talk about the Armenians. They say the kafir, the unbelievers. The Turkish boy was talking about Galenia and her family, the Hosepians, and about all the other Armenians in the district, Christians who are living in the Ottoman Empire, which was ruled by Muslims. The news of what the Turkish boy said to Galenia had reached her parents while she was in the pasture. When she raced home, arriving breathless, there was her father, Elias, heading out the door, carrying a rifle, a pistol, and a saber. The Ottoman Empire's nascent hatred and suspicion of the Christian Armenians had once again turned to violence. Elias was likely on his way to join with other Armenians to defend themselves from what was soon to be known worldwide as the Massacre of Adna. Adna is a large Turkish city with a program that stretched into villages such as the Sepians village had begun. 
Nana says, he hugged me, he kissed me, but he didn't say nothing. Nana, Melania, recalled. Her father ran towards a hill on a, on a way to a brook that he intended to follow into the village square. But before he gets there, on the hill, and then she just stopped speaking. And I imagine her head bowed as she went back into her deepest memory to relive what happened next. All I'll say is hundreds of them. And then bluntly she adds, he was killed, he was beaten. His body was found near the brook, not far from their farmhouse. He couldn't fight all those people, he tried, he did. They had taken off everything off him, only his white shirt, homespun, white shirt that goes way down to the knee. It's all homespun, rough stuff, and left him there, left him there. Exactly how he was killed is uncertain. Sometimes Nana says beaten, other times killed by a sword. However, the most common means of murder of Armenians in the villages was by a tool kept in every rural home, an ax. As she told that story in a tidy apartment in Dover, her stockings would have been rolled up just below her knees, her ever-present flowered apron draped in her lap. But in her heart, that spring day was not 80 years ago, it was now. And she still felt those mulberry leaves tickling her cheeks as she ran home to a life that was about to change forever. And his parents, Elias and Miriam, made the living as farmers and by selling the, their leaves from the mulberry trees as food for silkworms. They had five children, Gwenya, who was to become my grandmother, who was 10 years old when the Turks came for the Armenians, Sarah, 12, Joseph, six, Violet, five, and Moses, not quite a year old and not walking yet. After the murder of their husband and father, Josephians had no time to mourn. Now, alone in the farmhouse, they rented from a Turkish man. Galenia's mother had to protect herself and her five children, none of them old enough to be of much help in such dire straits. Now, on that spring day in 1909, they were no longer villages, no longer farmers, no longer a happy family. Now they were prey. Pray for the raging Turks who had killed Elias, a and left his body, stripped of all but that shirt on the rocky slope near a brook that fed the Orentis River. Pray for what was called at the time, quote, one of the most gruesome and savage bloodbaths recorded in human history, though it was but a prelude for what was to come in 1915. The bloodbath had begun just days before in the city of Adena, 150 miles away from the Asepian's village. It's unlikely that they or the other Armenians in the village knew what was happening in Adna, or were aware of the violence that was coming their way. No one was going to give advance notice of what the official or Ottoman position was, that the Armenians, the infidels, the Christian, the Kafir, had to be put in their place. The Osepians and the millions of other Armenians in the Ottoman Empire were a people without a country. At, a at that time, the empire established by Turkey in the 14th century included what are now the countries of Turkey, Hungary, Yugoslavia, Greece, Romania, Syria, Iraq, Lebanon, Israel, Jordan, and a small section of Russia on the Turkey's eastern border, a population of more than 15 million people. The Armenians and other Christians under Ottoman Empire rule lived as second-class citizens under a ruthless Islamic regime that saw them as the other, a dangerous other to be oppressed and exploited. The Kurds within the empire, most of them Muslim, were allowed to extort Armenians and kill those who did not comply without penalty because infidels deserve no protection. There was no punishment for the rape and abduction of Armenian women by Turks or Kurds. And officials were allowed to confiscate Armenian boys for conversion to Islam and forced military service. Armenians had to be deferential to Muslims in public. They could be punished for riding a horse when a Muslim was passing by and had to wear clothes that made it clearly identifiable as not Muslim. This was similar to the way Nazi Germany would treat the Jews just a few decades later. Just as the Turks depicted Christians as despicable others, Nazi propaganda depicted Jews as jogs and vermin. In the early years of the 20th century, 50 years before the Nazis would kill millions of Jews in gas chambers to solve the Jewish question, Ottoman Turkey under Sultan Abdul Hamid II, the so-called bloody Sultan, was grappling what was called the Armenian question. What should the empire do with those millions in their midst they did not trust because they were infidels? Armenians were a problem in that era because Turkey was losing its empire and needed a scapegoat, just as Jews would be the scapegoat Hitler would use to explain Germany's post-World War I ills. Armenians were not docile, though. They tried to fight back, just as Galenia's father had gathered his weapons when he heard the Turks were coming. 
but the strength and cruelty of the Ottomans was too much for the outnumbered Armenians. In one village, for example, Armenians tried to resist, but as they were being beaten, they realized they were no match for the Turkish army. The Turkish commander said he would free the Armenian rebels, who were led by a local priest, if they surrendered peacefully. But as soon as they gave up their arms, the commander had the priest seized and his eyes gouged out. Then they bayoneted him to death. The women of the villages were separated from the men and raped. The next night, the men were killed by a bayonet within hearing of their wives, sisters, and children. This was the world into which Galeni Hosepian, the woman who was to be my grandmother and lived next to me on Wentworth Street, was born. Now I'm going to read a little bit from chapter eight called Johnny's Here, but first a little background. My mother was Nana's oldest child. My mother's name was Kahadik, but she went with the name K because that was a lot easier in Dover. My father was an Irishman, Thomas Christie. They were both born and raised in Dover. My father's oldest brother, John W. Christie, was a local World War I hero, the first Dover boy to die in combat in that war. And the VFW post there is named for him and there's a monument to him um, on, uh, on Central Avenue. So from chapter eight. On the day of my birth, the calendar turned over and my family got a fresh start. The date was January 1, 1948. And my family was delivered up with antidote to the past. An antidote to that murder in a Turkish village. An antidote to the death of Nana's husband when uh, he was just a young man, starting to live the, I mean, the American dream. An antidote to two world wars and the depression. On that New Year's Day, just two years after the end of World War II, John Thomas Christie, me, offered Nana and my mother and father and my mother's siblings a life not forged by massacres, wars, and poverty. Someone had to be the unvictim. Someone was destined to have a life free of tragedy, worry, and even much responsibility. That's how I came to be the Prince of Wentworth Street, where I had parents and moved from the small apartment across town after I was born. Home for me until I was 12 was in the middle unit of that same three unit building where my mother had grown up on a dead end street in the mill town of about 20,000 people in the 1950s. There were only four buildings on Wentworth Street, one was an abandoned home across from my tenement, most of its windows broken by boys like me throwing rocks. A grumpy old man from the family that gave the street its name lived in another building, a two-story house with peeling paint and stuffed birds visible from the windows. A large Irish family, the Boyles, and I believe there may be some listening right now, lived in the third building, located at the bottom of the rutted street. Beyond them was Poppy's Field, once a grazing pasture, and now an empty lot, where the kids in the neighborhood play pickup baseball, sledded in winter, and dammed up streams in the spring. In the middle of the street, which was just a couple hundred yards from the city's main street, sat the fourth building, a rust-colored tenement, though not of the type you find in big cities, with each unit atop the one below. The, apartment, the apartments, each with a cellar, a first and second floor in an attic, lay side by side. One end unit was rented. My mother, father, brother, and I lived in the middle unit which we rented from the landlord, my mother's mother, my Nana. Nana and the five adult children who hadn't yet left the nest lived in the last unit. They were my second family. With their demanding jobs, one on the day shift and one on the second shift, my parents often had only enough time and energy to provide the basics of what I needed in the terms of the way of care and feeding. But time to reach to me to help me sit in their lap to fuss over me was in short supply. For that, I could always go to the other side of that tenement wall where I had another family of mothers and fathers who treated my arrival at the door as an event each time I showed up, even though I'd been there just the day before and would be there back the day after. They were the people I called Nana, Ami Mae, Aunt Liddy, Uncle Licky, Uncle George, and Uncle Dean, my mother's mother and her two sisters and three brothers. Every day, sometimes more than once a day, I would leave our apartment takes two steps down to the sidewalk, turn right, walk two steps up, and open the door to Nana's apartment. Johnny's here, one of them would explain. Do you want a glass of milk and some Tullo's cookies? They're just out of the oven. Next door, I could always find stacks of golden books in which toy tugboats are rescued and returned to a boy's bathtub, and a porky little puppy learns not to dig holes if he wants dessert. Did you bring that book with you? Sit on my lap and read to me. Do you see how good he reads? 
He's a real Professor Shingle Dingle. I was the beneficiary of a, of a phenomenon that was much praised until its demise, when it was much mourned, the extended family. I never heard that term growing up, and I doubt anyone in my family had either. But I was over there even when my mother or father was home, because in Nana's house, I was treated like a prince, or perhaps I should say a god. Because if gods name their animals, I name my aunts. I cannot say Aunt Mary. It came out Ami May, and because little Johnny had so decreed, that was what everyone called her. Lillian, the youngest daughter, was Aunt Liddy, not Aunt Lillian. And to this day, that's what she calls herself in her notes and emails to me. As the prince, my mispronunciations were not corrected, but acclaimed as a new proper way to speak. If I was the prince of our street of commoners, then Nana, Ami May, Aunt Liddy, Uncles Dean, George, and Licky were my courtiers, always delighted to be in my presence. Home from school for lunch at Nana's, I would be seated in an easy chair in front of the TV and delivered a tuna fish sandwich, some cookies, and a glass of milk on a tray while I was entertained by cartoons. Happily into my lunch, which was being served by my grandmother, I was, of course, unaware that she'd go up in an orphanage run by German Lutherans where the children had milk just once a year on the Kaiser's birthday. The prince's subjects showered him with coin. The Wentworth Street version was Uncle Dean losing his spare change between the cushions of his chair laughing while I dug out the pennies, nickels, and dimes. Aunt Liddy was off at nursing school when we moved next door, so I didn't see as much of her, but Ami May, who was just out of high school then, was the main attraction. She taught me my numbers by having me name each step as I walked up to the second floor. But when I got to the seventh step, I never said seven. Instead, I said fana. No one knew why or where it came from, but they all thought it was cute and clever and made me do it over and over. <clears throat> on Saturday nights, I sat next to her while she primped for a date with her fiancé, Art McKenney, whom I was so jealous of I called him Arthur Fark. He and his brother coached a youth basketball team, but I was a year too young to be allowed to play. For princes don't have to play by the rules. I mean, Mary persuaded Art to put me on the team. The uniform shirt went down nearly to my knees. When I was old enough to handle a rifle, Uncle Josh took me on a hunt for squirrels and blue jays, not wild boar like royalty. Well, we finished off with a feast, Milltown style, donuts and chocolate milk. The youngest uncle, Stephen, nicknamed Licky, was the one member of the extended family who didn't treat me as a precious cargo. As I grew from toddler to boy to teenager, I also grew closer to the free willing Licky and could intuit why he treated me differently than anyone else did. He sensed that I was, it was up to him to put a little bad boy in me, or a little swagger. All seemed normal on Wentworth Street. Uncles and fathers back from the war, everyone with jobs, his dry cleaner, roofer, which machinist, truck driver, a doting Nana. And in all those years of living one door over from her, I saw a little that seemed exotic or unusual about her. I knew nothing of her story or why there was always a darkness in her eyes, even when she was smiling and laughing. All I knew was that I had a grandmother who gave crushing hugs, whose hands smelled of chopped onions, who sang me a rhyme as she bounced me on her lap, who never failed to smile at me. She called me John Quincy Adams because she was an American now and all things were possible for, all, for her all-American grandson. Everything I did or said was so exclaimed over, it was as if no other little boy had ever existed and I was a prototype. One of her jobs when I was a boy was working for a dry cleaner as a steam presser. In the summer, when the work had to be oppressive, I would ride my bike the mile or so up to the Brook Cleaners because I knew when I get there, she'd reach into her, into her big black pocketbook and give me a nickel to get a cold seven up from the vending machine. She'd pinch my cheek, kiss me, and then I was on my way, riding one-handed while guzzling down the tonic, oblivious to her sacrifice and pain. However, even as, even as a boy, I did not need all the details of her life to pick up what was implied by hints, by looks, by perhaps what I could taste in the stuffed grape leaves. Feelings don't need all the facts. Her memories can almost be seen in the deep wells of her eyes that shine up from the photo of her holding me tightly in her lap. The once starving Armenian woman and the well-fed Amer American boy. The woman's muscled forearms strengthened by spooling cotton in the mill and lifting presses of the dry cleaner, holding that child in an unbreakable walk. This little one, says the photo, is safe. The Turks may come, a war may come, deprivation may come. I will keep my grandson safe from all that. 
Tragedy doesn't need explication to be sensed, to be unconsciously grafted onto your own soul. I heard things that were said and knew what they, that they were important enough, even though I didn't understand them. Heard my grandmother say the words, dirty Turk, heard the word genocide, and knew that whatever it was, it was a reason Anna had lost her father. By the time I was in high school, I knew the Armenians had been victims of a genocide, as the Jews had been victims of a Nazi genocide. But what the Nazis did to the Jews was a history I knew much better than what the Turks had done to the Armenians, because Hitler's atrocities were covered in history classes and were fought for popular culture, the only culture I was exposed to growing up in Dover when I did. But what happened to the Armenians wasn't mentioned in any of my classes, and it wasn't until 2017 that a single Hollywood movie was made about the Armenian genocide. The facts about the Armenian genocide that engulfed my whole family were still mostly unknown to me until late in life, when after the death of my nana and my parents and my brother, my only sibling, and then I felt a pressing need to reconnect to my past, to find my true self, to answer that question from my Baltimore catechism, who made me? Now I'll read a bit from chapter 10, Scout's Honor. At the end of each school week, the boys at St. Mary Academy, the boys and girls at St. Mary Academy, were marched a half, half mile up Central Avenue to St. Joseph Catholic Church, which I attended every Sunday. Single file, boys on the outside of the sidewalk, girls on the inside, heads bowed, no talking. First offense, a glare from sister like an eagle eyeing, eyeing carrion. Second offense, plan to get a wooden ruler knuckle whack when you were back in the classroom. It was time to confess our sins. Before we left for confession, the nuns prepped us by reviewing one by one each of the Ten Commandments. Boys and girls, put your heads down and consider if you have violated the first commandment since your last confession. Have you honored our Lord? Have you been a good Catholic? 50 boys and girls, classes were huge in those baby boomer days, sitting in rows of wooden chairs, rested their heads on their arms that they had crossed on top of the desk. We think about our sins. Were we good Catholics? Did we have any false gods before or since last Friday? Perhaps if we were not the perfect junior saint, our, main, our minds wanted to baseball to Mary Lee, the cutest girl in the class. In the classroom, a silent minute goes by and sister moves on to the next commandment. Have we taken the Lord's name in vain? Here there were likely some takers, for there were a few homes, including mine, where patience to false swear was not Jesus, Mary, and Joseph. And if your mother or father said it, well, those rougher kids among us picked it up to sling around the playroom out of sister's earshot. Commandment number three, failure to go to church every Sunday and on the holy days might have found a few sinners among the boys and girls who came from the wrong side of the tracks, whose parents didn't get them up every Sunday, forced them into the best clothes to sit and kneel and stand the excruciating 60 minutes of the mass. Until the eighth commandment, the shelt nuts made some sense to me, to all of us, whether we were six years old in the first grade or 13 in the eighth grade. But number eight threw me and everyone else, I assume. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Here was a nun offering a young woman who had entered the convent right of high school, asking us if we had committed an act that was a mystery to us and probably barely understood by her. Yet we put our heads back on the desk and waited quietly until sister wanted number nine. Have we coveted our neighbor's wife? I knew my mother complained about the skimpy outfits of the woman who lived kitty corner from us on Hengelar Avenue. She's just showing off for the men, my mother said, when the woman walked around a yard in shorts and a top that exposed a few inches of her belly. My father said nothing. Maybe he was coveting. Or was my mother doing the coveting, whatever that was? I was pretty sure it wasn't something I was doing, so I didn't confess to that or to adultery. Although I bet a few kids did, and that made for a good laugh for the priest. In any case, we kept our confessions, whatever they were, to ourselves until we entered the confessional. That oaken box the size of a closet where a priest sat on one side and we kneeled on the other, awaiting the moment when the father would slide open the yellow tinted window and say, yes, my son. And then you began, planning to confess just enough to appear normal for your age and not enough to induce his wrath. St. Mary Academy, which entered at age five, the youngest in my class, and gradu graduated from at age 13, was, and still is, a three-story rep brick monolith that squatted on Dover's central artery. 
The playground was an L-shaped expanse of rust, rough asphalt surrounded by chain leak fence. When the morning whistle blew, we obediently broke away from our playground cliques and lined up by grade and gender on the asphalt and entered the school up the wide staircase, hung our coats on hooks in the hallways and took our assigned seats. All of it sternly overseen by those black obelisks that were our teachers. Together, St. Mary's and home and the Boy Scouts formed into the good boy, the humble boy, the deferential boy, the respectful boy. Those norms were universal in the 1950s and early 60s, just overemphasized in my upbringing. At home, there was rarely a swear word. No complaining was allowed. Eyeing with my little brother got me a sharp, sharp stop it. Meanwhile, I saw my father head to work wearing the same cheap jacket all winter long. My mother get her entertainment for free class, classes held by the local university. So I counted myself lucky that I was not the kid in school with patched pants, pants and a bunch of greasy leftovers for lunch. Yes, the knowledge of my parents' self-sacrifice had a powerful effect on my good boyness. Two outside agencies, my parochial school, elementary and high school, and my Catholic Boy Scout troop reinforced those feelings. Any impulse to sin, to utter a swear word, to indulge an impure thought, to disobey any of the authority figures that loomed over me was counted on all sides. The prescriptions of the time and place were even codified in the two books that were the staples of my earliest years. The assignment, the assigned reading from school and the scouts, the Baltimore Catechism and the Boy Scout Handbook. I ate up everything the Boy Scouts could offer me. But as puberty started kicking in, another big idea pushed its way into my psyche. An idea as strong and ancient as the inner voice that says, do the right thing. This idea was to be a boy, not with halo overhead, but with torn jeans, dirty hands, bloody nose, and secrets. Not just boy, but male, having a life independent from school, church, and home. I was starting to think about shedding the tight-fitting skin I was fitted with back in Wentworth Street. All that I learned at home and from the Baltimore Catechism and the Boy Scout Handbook was stay with me, help to find me as an adult. But between child and adulthood, there was a gap to be filled. Now a story from the early 60s and about being a Dover boy. From chapter 13 called Max Wild Ride. When I was 11, we moved to 167 Henry Law Avenue. I was in a beige to crave independence and I was now in a place where those who had looked after me and monitored my every move, Nana the, Nana, the aunts and uncles, could not simply look out the window and see what I was doing. A door had closed and another had opened, giving me an opportunity to move on from being the good boy. Not only was I leaving a neighborhood, and I hoped an identity, but I was also moving from childhood to teenagehood, a land I knew about as much as I did about the mythical middle class. My idea of what a teenage boy was supposed to be like came from TV, programs like The Spin and Marty Show, the two boys got into and then out of trouble. I understood I wasn't going to be able to make this transition on my own by just suddenly being a teenager in training. I could daydream all I wanted about the boy I thought I should become, but I felt that that's all it would ever be, a daydream, if I didn't put down my copy of Boy's Life magazine and start roaming my new neighborhood. I spot of almost middle class, was one hill up Henry Law Avenue from a neighborhood much like Wentworth Street, where there were parents who worked in mills in the shipyard in Portsmouth. They lived in apartments or small houses, sun no more than the large cottages, all squeezed together in streets that fed down a series of slopes to the center of town in a big brick, brick mill in the downtown shops. That's the neighborhood I find myself wandering in that summer of 1959, a few months before my 12th birthday. I don't know what drew me there at first, but boys of that era were free to roam by foot or bike to run across other boys. This was a dozen or so years after the soldiers, sailors, and Marines returned home from Europe and the Pacific, got married, and started having kids. So one day where you went in the U.S., from Dover to Hampshire to the San Fernando Valley, there were lots of other 11 and 12-year-old boys off for the summer, looking for a baseball game, riding bikes, trading at Ted Williams full of Willie Mays, Topps bubblegum card, by getting together on a ready afternoon for a game of Pachisi. All I had to do to find them was walk down Henry Law a quarter mile, take a right at Wallingford Street, and there at the curb was a group of boys. They were dribbling and passing a basketball in the street, but there was no basket, no backboard. 
you guys going down to the playground for a game, I asked, because I love basketball and knew I could hold my own in a pickup game. And if I did well, then maybe I could be part of whatever this was. The tallest one grabbed the ball, set it on a cocked hip, and held it there with his arm. He was wearing what we all wore back then, dungarees, T-shirt, white sneakers. He's lean and tall and looked like he could play the game. Everyone was waiting for his reply. We're going to make our own court right here, he said, pointing at the wide curve of the street. Come back tonight and help us. Hey, Mac, one of the boys said, we're going to do that thing with the hood now? The lean boy with the basketball said, yeah, let's do it. The fluid underhand toss, he whipped the ball to one of the boys, who put his hand out just in time to avoid a shot to the chest. In the next six to eight years, I played a lot of basketball with Mac, and I learned to be ready for his passes. He slinged the ball down the court like a football, leading you by a few yards as you ran towards the basket, the ball thrown in a line like a frozen rope. The timing was perfect so that when you caught and dribbled two or three times, you were under the basket ahead of the defender, positioned for an easy layup. The boys followed him down a driveway next to the small house, where I later found he lived with his three brothers, sister and mother, Catherine McEnany. I followed too. No one said not to, and I picked up what was in the air. This was some sort of club or gang even, and this lanky one was a leader. At the end of the driveway, a detached hood from a car lay upside down. It had to come from an older car, the hood came to a point with tall sides like a late forties design. Mac went into his basement and came up with a long chain. He wrapped one end around a strut inside the hood, securing it with a double hitch. Then ran the, train, the chain further down the driveway where a green Plymouth was parked. He got down on his back and shimmied out of the Plymouth and attached the other end of the chain to the undercarriage. Max said, okay, Chev, you go first. I was getting the idea, not just what, what was to come next, but also who these kids were. Mac tied a rope to the point of the hood, like the reins on a horse, and got behind the wheel of the Plymouth. He looked about two years older than me, not old enough to drive. A half dozen more kids, younger ones who were hanging around, jumped into the car with him. Mac drove the car and the attached hood out to the field right behind his house and stopped at a place where the hood stood in thick grass. Chef stepped into it, grabbed the rope reins, widened his stance, leaned back, and nodded his head. Mac took off slowly, giving Chef a chance to get his balance, then drove away, dragging the upturned hood behind like a sled. Chev got cocky and let go with one hand, raising his arm to the sky like a rodeo rider on a bronco. Mac came to the top of the hill, turned right, and Chev almost negotiated the turn. But the apex flew off into the deep grass and came up yelling, Hell of a ride, boys, who's next? So it went all afternoon, everyone getting their chance, unaware and indifferent to the fact that a perfectly good registered car was driven by an underage boy bouncing over a rutted field that you could, and that you could slip and slice your face on the edge of the hood. But the car could stop quick in the hood and you could slide under the trunk. <clears throat> For the kids too small to stand up in the hood, Mac would sit them down two at a time, hand them the reins and give them a ride up and down the hill. We didn't have a lake. We didn't have a boat. We didn't have water skis. But on that day, Mac could figure out how everyone could go water skiing just the same. I waited for my turn, not sure in my different way of being the newest guy would even be offered a turn, or if I would take it if offered. Until that I had been avoiding danger and risk assiduously, as I avoided mortal sin, venial sin, and the impure thoughts and nuns and priests wandered us about, whatever they were. When I went to confession, all I had to confess was I fought with my brother. But now risk was about to present itself, and I was going to have to make a choice. I didn't want to come home from the new neighborhood bruised or bleeding, or even with torn dungarees, enough to explain myself, and my mother yelled, Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, and bite her fist in anger, her standard response to just about any minor infraction. But now is the moment for the good boy to become one of the boys. I'd hoped to do that by sticking a few of my turnaround hook shots, not by being pulled around a bumpy field by a kid in a car he should be driving while I rode unprotected in a big hunk of metal. But no one had been hurt yet, so why should I be? Hey. Kid, new kid, your turn, Max said. Well, at least I was in. All I had to do was step onto this old hood, hold on tight, and, and what? I was tempted to make the sign of the cross, which we all did before we went to bat or did anything we figured could benefit from acknowledging Jesus, but no one else did, even though they're all like me, Catholic, so I didn't either. Signal when you're ready, Max said.
Then he gave me the new kid treatment. He took off quicker than he had for anyone else, and I was knocked on my ass, but managed to stay inside the hood. Mac kept the pedal down until he had to ease up to make the turn at the top of the hill, at which point I crawled up on my knees and got hold of the reins. I was, a, I was able to stand up again and make the rest of the trip on my feet. No one was asked if I was hurt. No one said sorry about that. No one treated me like the firstborn grandson, the precious, precious offspring of an oppressed minority, the consolation for a genocide. No special treatment was asked, none given, just like everyone else. Now, a little bit more about Dover in those days from chapter 15, which I've titled The Wooden Nickels. Because every time I left the house, my dad said the same thing to me. Don't pick up any wooden nickels. Now, from the book. In Milltown, you started work early, came home early, and ate supper early. The last meal of the day was called supper, not dinner. Dinner was what you ate in the middle of the day. Unless it was at school, then it was called lunch. At 4.15 p.m. every day, my father would emerge from a small door on the south end of, a, of the red brick behemoth called Pacific Mills and come home to the house on Henry Lord Avenue for supper. The mill dominated, and still does, dominate the center of town as mills like it, and even bigger did, in Manchester, New Hampshire, Lawrence, Mass, Providence, Rhode Island, and other towns large and small across New England. Towns powered by an immigrant workforce and by an abundance of hydroelectricity, the great rivers that sliced the region. The Pacific Mills' centrality to Dover's growth from rural to industrial, from a few thousand people to the 20,000 when I lived there, is signaled even now by how you get around the center of town. Whether you're coming from the south or the north, when you approach the downtown, the main road splits like a river flowing on an island. The island is the mill. Once you've driven around it, the road merges once again. The mill was built of the Kachika River, which begins 30 miles upstream from Dover, and for years provided the city's power from the falls squeezed between the downtown shopping district and the mill. The river, like all rivers of industrial America, was then more a running sewer than a body of water, picking up the waste from tanneries, shoe stops, dairy farms, and the effluent from homes along the river. When the river ran over the falls, it revealed its true color and sent up its true odor. It pretty much smelled the way it looked, brown. In my neighborhood, when you wanted to intimidate another kid, you didn't threaten to beat him up. You said if he didn't wise up, you were going to throw him into the Kachiko. From the, the mid-19th century to 1940, the mill spun and wove cotton for clothes, sheets, furnishings, even toys, all printed with geometric, floral, and other colorful designs under the brand Kachiko. In 1900, Kachiko mills manufactured 50 million yards of printed fabric to be sent all over the world. In 1937, the cotton mill was closed when cheaper labor and electrification in the South attracted cotton and woolen mills from all over the Northeast to move to the Carolinas and Georgia. The city tried to get another large manufacturer to take over the mill, but that never happened. Instead, some sections of the complex were occupied by discrete companies. All other sections remained vacant. One of those smaller companies was called Eastern Air Devices, and that's where dad worked when I was a boy. Each day he emerged from the tiny mouth of that whale that lay across the city, breathing the last gas of an endangered species, American manufacturing. In the warm weather, dad wore heavy cotton work pants, a shade of green that would hide a grease stain, and a light shot sleeve shirt over a pale yellow, uh, often a pale yellow, over his white t-shirt. In the winter, he wore a cheap polyester jacket with horizontal stripes. I don't recall a hat to cover his wavy gray hair. He carried a black metal lunchbox, big enough for two ham sandwiches and a thermos of coffee. The middle finger of his right hand was stained yellow from the ever-present lucky strikes, the crushed package with a big red circle stuffed in the breast of his shirt, his breast pocket of his shirt, excuse me. Oh, I'll uh, conclude with a small piece of the last chapter. That is about my grandmother. We'll go back to her story again. And my plan to do what she could never do, which was return to the village where her father was killed and reclaim it in her name. In 2017, traveling with my 37 year old son, Nick, I found my way to the village in the remote hills of Turkey. And when I got there, finding her village, 
I tore some leaves off a mulberry tree to bring back to a gravestone on Pine Hill Cemetery. Now I'll read a little bit from that last chapter. When I returned to the US, my wife, my friends, and my family all had the same question. <clears throat> How did it make you feel to find what you were looking for? I replied that I felt touched and saddened at the time, but now, with more time to reflect, I felt something else. When I remembered looking up at the wide and deep valley, uh, looking up the wide and deep valley from Bidius, the village of her, in her district, and then down to the silver, the sliver of turquoise Mediterranean, I felt anger. Life in Bidius was likely hard work for the Asepians, but it was home. Home surrounded by mulberry trees and fruit trees, home where their hard work and the land provided them with a place to grow much their own food, <clears throat> raise cows for milk, yogurt, and cheese, bake their own bread on fires stoked by wood they gathered. I was angry that my Nana was forced from a home for no other reason that she was the wrong religion, the wrong ethnicity. <clears throat> it's a story as old as time. Sometimes it's the Christians who are disdained, humiliated, jailed, deported, killed. Sometimes it's the Muslims, sometimes it's the Jews. Sometimes it's the people of the wrong color, who wear the wrong clothes, who speak the wrong language. It's a story that never ends and goes on even today, in every culture, in every country. Looking up at her village that day, I could picture my Nana there as the nine-year-old girl who went to gather the cows, who ran through a field of grass and trees, an innocent child, still unaware she was the only moments away from losing that innocence and her home forever. Galeni Hosepian, later Rose Banyan, later Nana, survived another 87 years, had six children, seven grandchildren, and, and 10 great-grandchildren. 110 years after the Ottoman Turks came to kill the infidels of Pythias, two of those descendants, a grandson and a great-grandson, found her home. By her presence, we have proclaimed that she survived. They could not kill her. They could not erase her or her family. We were proof of that. Thank you, and I'll be glad to answer some of these questions. Shoot, is anybody seen? No, the question is. Oh, there it goes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So here's, here's the, the question. question. Okay. Which have it right here. Okay, I've got a question here uh, from Gregory Judanian. Uh, to all of us. Mark, you can answer this too. One question I have is, how do you think that your life, how do you think of your identity being different if you were not Armenian? Uh, I think that um, the, difference, the difference would have been, I wouldn't have known a good food is to begin with. Uh, because no offense to my Irish friends who are on this call, but that's pretty much overcooked meal and meat and potatoes uh, and beer. Uh, but seriously, I think that uh, if I hadn't had those family living next to me, uh, I, I wouldn't have had, the, I think, the, the warmth and love that they gave me. And then the Armenian part of it, I think, does change who you are. I think that in the, in, in the book, I, I do a, I quote from a study by a BU professor, uh, Professor Afton Dillian, uh, about the trauma that's handed down uh, from anybody, but in this case, Armenians, whose family members were subject to something like a genocide. It doesn't stop with them. Uh, I think a lot of the family afterwards is affected by that emotionally. And I think in the case of the children, especially the grand, grandchildren, they're brought up in an atmosphere uh, where they're supposed to be safe and taken care of because I think the, uh, the parents and grandparents are, don't want what happened to them to happen to their uh, children and grandchildren. So that, that was a difference. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's so hard to, to separate that from the rest of my life. But I, I want to say one thing about the book. The book, somebody's asking, what is the book about? And maybe this answers the question somewhat. The book is about one word, loyalty. 
the book is my hope and need to express loyalty to those people and many of them the Armenian side of the family that sacrificed for me and I'm sure your family did the same thing and uh, whom I wanted to uh, honor in a way to be permanent and, and thus we have the book uh, and their story. Mark do you want to answer that too? Well I mean I, I agree with everything you said even though uh, you know we grew up in the same place albeit 20 years apart from each other. I think a, a lot of uh, a lot of those experiences that shaped us are, are very similar in a lot of ways. And uh, for me, it's it's I can't think of a time when it didn't have some impact on my thinking about who I was or or how I look at the world. And as I said, I, growing up uh, in in Dover, I was constantly. Uh, either what because I felt like I needed to or because people asked me to uh, explaining what uh, what an Armenian was what Armenia is what how they ended up here what and all that stuff and it's kind of what I do for a living now so in, in a weird sort of way I guess it was a good uh, a good training for for my my adult the work of my adult life which is trying to uh, in some way explain Armenian things uh, to other Armenians and to non-Armenians as well. Susan, are there any other questions? I don't see any. No. Anybody have a question? Oh, wait, here's somebody's raised their hand. Let's see. That means. All right, so Jody wants to ask you a question. Okay. Um, you unmute Jody, you could do that. Am I talking? Yeah. Oh, hi. Uh, um, I, I was wondering who his favorite cousin is. Well, she uh -oh. lives a long, long ways away. <laughs> and she has a lovely daughter I'm thinking about. I bet not say anything because more than one cousin is on this. Mark, this is my cousin, Jody Goodman, uh, my Aunt Mitty's daughter. <laughs> All I couldn't resist. California. Oh. I don't know. Vicky may be on this call too, so I may have to say Vicky and Jody. Uh, and that was an easy one. Don't worry about it. Love you, John. I love uh -huh. you. I have a question for you, John. I don't think I've asked you this when we've talked, but uh, when you were not just when you were growing up, but through your or through your adult life, how how much did you think about all this stuff that you have obviously put a great deal of thought into in in the course of writing the book, or was it always pushed away somewhere? Well, you know, anytime you meet anybody and you get to know someone, they, they they're going to ask you a question. Well, what are you? Yeah, that was the question. What are you? Which means you know, name your ethnicity or name your religion. Um, so I was always, that part of it was, well, I'm, you know, I'd say I'm Irish and Armenian. And people would say, what's, an, what's Armenia? And I would, you know, it's in the book, well, that's it. Where is it? You know, and you have to explain, well, it's, it's in Russia now, but it wasn't always in Russia. And then people, you know, like, that was all they wanted to know. It was, didn't make any sense. And they, they didn't hold it against you, but it didn't make any sense to them. So I was always aware that this was something different. And I did, it didn't bother me much. And so it made me interested in it, but I never went very far with it. Uh, I think the, the closest with my grandmother and her, and her children um, is what I what I felt as Armenian. I you know when there were a few Armenians in Dover growing up, but I only knew uh, my cousins and one other family. I didn't even know about your family, so I felt it was this uh, on the one hand different, on the other hand kind of distinctive because no one else was one of these. Uh, and then to, you know as you got older and discovered the history and the importance of the culture. Um, and and we're such a small culture. It was interesting because you when I when I was a younger person, you could name all the Armenians in the country were famous. You know, there was a coach of Notre Dame, and there was Arlene Francis, who everybody that uh, she's Armenian because that didn't, so there were like two are famous Armenians growing up, right? Arapasigan and, and Arlene Francis, and then along came Cher. We figured out she was Armenian, oh. and now you know we've got some other famous Armenians from California. So I think it, 
it, it's kind of a funky, interesting group to be part of. Uh, and you can make, as you meet people, as I've met people, and including Naomi and my wife, and you talk about this, oh, I knew a Armenian person. Oh, he was my, a teacher I knew I loved. You hear a lot of good things about Armenians. I don't think there are anybody in the ethnic group, but when I mention this to people, I often get a pretty nice story from somebody. Is that the Kardashians you're talking about? Yeah, right. Yes, yeah. <laughs> that, that's kind of a kind of a mixed blessing for Armenians to <laughs> to uh, to recognize them. They actually have, have, have taken the issue with Armenia pretty seriously, but mm. other than that, they're kind of an embarrassment. Yeah, yeah. My coworker asked if you were going to mention the Kardashians, and I thought, no way in heck. That, but that, you did. Somehow it comes up. <laughs> uh, uh, cousin Jody, you still there? Uh, sure. You, she, might, she doesn't care for the Kardashians. I know that. I do, not, I, them, I, think. I do not. I think. I do. I do not care for them. <laughs> <laughs> it's another question. Ah, uh, my grandmother would have called you a pasha, not a prince. <laughs> thank you for sharing your family story with the Dover Library and Public Schools. Now I read your book. Well, thank you. You know, I, I often the, the the title of the book was, and Naomi, my wife, came up with the title, and it. And what's going to, it, it, I have to explain it. It's a good, I think it fits the book pretty well, I think. But if I say to people, what's, hey, you wrote a book. Well, I mean, what's the name of your book? The Prince of Wentworth Street. Ah, so I can see in their eyes, I think I'm some kind of important prince-like person. I say, if you ever saw Wentworth Street, you know, no princes ever came from Wentworth Street. And as, that is, you know, poor and simple as it was growing up, it's really horrible now. I believe they're, there are no occupied buildings in the street now. If, if anybody from Dover who's on, on this call can correct me, I believe now that Charlie Boyle has passed away. He's the last person living in the street. And uh, so all, all those buildings are, are vacant. It's a pretty rough street now. Well, thank you, John. That was really great. I really especially loved the story about you surfing on the hood of a car. That was, sounds pretty death defying. I think looking at the list of people who were here, the guy who made all that trouble was on this. On this, on this yeah. <laughs> That's great. Oh, he wants to speak. Here, let me ask, allow him to talk. Here we go. Ah. Is this the one? It's one of them. <laughs> one of them. <laughs> hey, Kevin. Hey, John. Hey, Kevin. Uh, just want to let you know that uh, since Charlie Boyle passed away, uh, someone purchased that house, and they've uh, taken the house down but left the foundation, and they've rebuilt a couple of new units there. So there are some oh. new occupants on the end of Boyle Street. Oh, good. The, the street the street survives uh, because my old house is still pretty vacant and run down. I don't know if it's even you being being a builder as you are. Is the is the old house I lived in salvageable? Uh, I think it is if it's taken care of in a short period of time, but it's quickly losing its structural integrity. Yeah, that's too bad. That's too bad. Well, I'm glad I'm glad something's happening in the street. Next time I'm down there, I'll uh, I'll drive by. Thanks, Kevin. Well, I do know I do know the owners, so I may have a discussion with them. Oh, okay. Uh, the owner of the, uh, my old house. Yes. Yeah. I, I, is it my right? Is it a, is it a woman with an Armenian name? Uh, that's very likely. I yeah, yeah. I think you're probably right. Yes. Yeah, I've heard that. Yeah. Well, you tell that that book is historically important now. I mean, but the house is historically important. As a matter of fact, I did uh, run into her and her husband. And uh, they knew about your book and had copies of it. Oh, well, that, maybe that will, that will inspire them. Let's hope. Yeah. Thanks, Kev. Yeah, this is a great job. This is wonderful to ch chime in tonight. I really loved it. Well, uh, Kevin, thank you for your help. You and, you and, you and your brother uh, were big uh, sources for these stories, even though I may have elaborated a bit on some of them. Maybe not enough. <laughs> Probably true.
Go ahead, Nancy. Yes. Um, John, I think I told you the story earlier, but I upset Charlie Boyle quite a bit when he went to the city and asked him to change the name to Boyle Street. And he said, at first they weren't gonna do it until I told them I lived there. And I told him that, Charlie, that's not why they changed it. They changed it because I went to the city and told them Johnny Boyle was born in that house. <laughs> so Charlie was annoyed, but then he laughed and we laughed about that for quite a while. So I claim that it got named Boyle Street, not for Charlie, but for my husband, Johnny. <laughs> No, oh, that's wonderful, Nancy. That's great, and uh, and I'm sure any time you got going with Charlie, there was going to be a lot of laughs. <laughs> Indeed. Pat was a big help for. I talked to Pat. Pat helped me with some background for the book. So, uh, yeah. you know, I remember those days very well. And and uh, and your older sister was uh, my babysitter. Uh huh. Yeah. Well, you know, another thing that I think I mentioned to you earlier, um, I traveled to Armenia. And indeed, the people there were wonderful, very pleasant, very friendly. And when I told our guide that your grandmother, who was still living, had a sister who had returned to Armenia, she had her brother take a note from me to that sister. And we exchanged gifts, and your grandmother's sister was able to be in touch with her again. And that was one of the best things about that trip for me to Armenia. It reconnected your grandmother with her sister. Your sister Sarah? Yeah. Wow, that's a heck of a story. Nancy. When I come to Dover, I have to talk to you more about it. I'd love to meet with you, John. Thank you. I'll do that as soon as, as, soon as all this crazy stuff is over. OK. A couple other people want to talk. Uh, somebody's phoning in on a Motorola phone. I muted them just to keep the background quiet, but I'll unmute now. Thanks. That's me. Yay. Hi, John. Hi. This is Kathy Cholin. Oh, hi, Kathy. Good to talk to you. Uh, so I just wanted you to know that the, uh, the Greeks always knew who the Armenians were. <laughs> And, and I remember, I remember, right, we both have good food. That's right, we know how to cook. Yeah, uh, uh, a lot of my, my Greek friends here in Massachusetts, almost the first people around here to buy the book, because, you know, they, they were also, uh, the Greeks were also uh, victims of uh, the Turkish genocide and Turkish murders. Yes, yes, so my great-grandmother, when she came over here, was so homesick that she went back to Greece with her oldest son, and uh, left the rest of the family here with their father. Wow, yeah, there's a lot of, there's a lot of stories there. They're all- I said, do you remember going to the Uptown Theater or the Strand Theater, you and Gary and my brother Michael oh my and me? Yeah. Wow. we go up, you made me cross that railroad bridge down by Henry Law. Uh, mm -hmm. I did that? Oh, I said- Yes, you did. <laughs> I did. And I was scared going across that little bridge. Wow. But I read your book and it's wonderful. Thank you. I appreciate your interest in the book and, and, and that, that, that you made the trouble to be here today. I really appreciate that a lot. Well, I wouldn't have missed it for the world. Thank you, dear. Thank you. And, and someone has asked, will, 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 uh, uh, Nancy Collegian, is, I think her name is Nancy, it's End Collegian, maybe it's a guy. Uh, will, you write it, will you write another book? And um, yeah, I think so. Uh, I'm still in the process of, of, of getting the word out about this book, but I've got a, I've got a few ideas, but none of them are well formed. That, although I have, I have, uh, I have a, a little bit of interest from a theatrical producer who thinks this book could be turned into a play. So uh, probably my next writing project will be trying to write a play based on the book. Oh, wonderful, John. Yes. Steve Kirkson. Hey, Steve. How are you been, my friend? Good. How are you, my friend? I'm doing well. John, um, I had to ring off uh, about halfway through your discussion and take a phone call. And I wondered, uh, I grew up in a non-Armenian neighborhood in, in Boston, one of the uh, Dorchester 
and I wondered what, and I didn't, it, it, it worked against my appreciating my Armenian heritage and history uh, because the kids I was hanging around with were multi-ethnic, uh, multi-race and all. Uh, did you have that experience and how, when did you start propounding upon your armenian on the street among your friends? When did you start telling them about, you know, uh, your, how proud you were of your heritage? You know what, Steve, um, and a lot of my, a lot of my friends in the neighborhood are on this call and, and uh, where I grew up, if every, almost every, if you weren't Irish, you were, you were French Canadian and then it was just a smattering of everything else. Exactly. Uh, um, you know, there were some Greeks, there were some Lebanese, um, you know, I can't recall knowing any Italians. It was a Jewish family across the street, but I didn't know that was the rabbi and his family. We don't have the Jewish people besides them. Um, uh, so, I mean, it would just, it would come up, it would come up. People, people knew my grandmother, uh, Kevin, the, 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 the Macanese knew, oh, Aunt Rose, Rosie Beatty, and everybody loved her. She was a lovable person. So people were aware of these things, but, uh, making it an important part of my life really didn't really happen until I got quite a bit older and um, really had this sort of midlife crisis where I said, where I really needed to figure out who I was because I, you know, I, as I write in the first part of the book, I'd been divorced. Um, I had all these deaths of my family, my brother, right. um, my, uh, I have job and my company was sold and I was out without the, uh, the titles one has, uh, husband, brother, uh, son, uh, publisher, journalist. Uh, still, I still was a journalist, but I know the job of publisher. And it sort of is a point in your life, you say, well, wait a minute, when those titles are gone, do I know who I am? Good for you. And, and uh, so I said, well, I think, you know, you, you and I, Steve Kirchin, a very famous investigative reporter, three Pulitzer Prizes, and I'm a I'm a, I'm a second-rate investigative journalist, but we both do the same kind of work, and we know well, we don't have answers to questions as investigative journalists. We just go back to the beginning. We keep asking why and why of why and why of why, and we, we, we dig into, our, into something. So what I had to dig into was myself, and that's when I got in touch much more deeply with, with uh, my history of my Armenian family and how who they were. Uh, this is obvious. Who your parents were affects who you, who you are, but in my case, because it was such this big tragedy in the family, it affected me in a very profound way that I had to really uncover and then make peace with by going to where it all happened. Uh, and, uh, and that's why I ended the book, the, the story tonight, with, uh, with a, a piece of, of how that happened. The actual very end of the book, by the way, is taking those mulberry leaves and putting them on my grandmother's gravestone in Dover at the Pine Hill Cemetery, which all the Dover folks would have. Yeah, yeah. There's there is a similarity in our journeys, my friend, and uh, I'm so pr I'm so glad you wrote the book because it's cathartic, but it also <coughs> is, it gives fruit to the next generation and the generation after. That if you, you really your roots are so important to be understood and what made you who you no, are. And Steve, another part of it, and Mark will appreciate this too, and anybody else's Armenian the call, everybody will appreciate this. I've been to book groups uh, here and there and talked to people who read the book and who aren't Armenian. And they said to me, oh, you know, I've heard of that Armenian thing a little bit, or maybe I never heard of it, but I didn't know much about it. And now I've learned a lot more about it. And and I, I think, I've, you know, all of us who have written these books and done these things like you and, and yeah. Mark, we're all adding to the, the knowledge of this horrible event that not enough people know about when they but when they know about it they understand and appreciate it and i think you know in some way support this this cause of, of recognition uh for the genocide so i'd like you know there's a lot of books about the armenian genocide a lot of mem good memoirs and, and my book has got a bibliography the back about some of them but i think you know my little book is added to people's knowledge of this of this event and uh i'm a little bit proud of that very much so Congratulations, my friend. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. A um, couple other, oops, sorry. A couple other people wanted to talk. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, John, this is Jim. Um, hey, Jim. Really, <laughs> yeah, I do. Here with the book. 
yeah, really enjoyed the book. Uh, it's um, a, a great uh, kind of balance between the tragedy and the comedy. Um, you did an excellent job on the, uh, the whole uh, uh, manuscript and uh, brought back a lot of memories of uh, childhood at Dover. But uh, I think your research on the um, Armenian genocide, you know, is really uh, uh, noteworthy and you really went to the extra effort, you know, to travel to Turkey to the Armenian uh, communities there and, uh, and uncovered a lot of, uh, you know, important things, but also uh, sad things. So nice job and I appreciate the effort. Well, you know, I appreciate you uh, doing so many good things that made good chapters of the book. This is, to everybody who's on, on the call, this, this says, this is, this is the map of the Maxwell Ride right here. He wound up being a pretty successful guy. He wasn't always a crazy man. Ah. Uh. And Michael wanted to speak. Yeah, I'm I'm, I'm Elaine Parnagian Hashem. Uh, John, your mother and your Aunt Mary babysat me and my sister. I'm a little bit older than you. <laughs> Yeah. I loved your book. I really loved it. I'm Marky's art, by the way. Mark's oh, you're art. Mark oh, hi. <laughs> you met my sister, Evelyn. I, I did. So what a lovely woman. What a nice woman. I'm so glad I met her. I got to know her. Yeah, I think she is, but she's my sister, of course. <laughs> and I'm Lebanese. Yeah, and my husband is Lebanese. He wants you to know. <laughs> so you eat, you eat well in your house. Yes, and he's the best cook. <laughs> well, nice. Maybe we can have you over sometime, John. Uh, well, but this will be great. Do you, you folks live in Dover? Yeah, well, we live in Barrington. We grew, both uh, grew up in Dover. Uh, well, I know Barrington well. Yeah, uh, when this is all over, I'm definitely going to come to Dover and, and, and meet a lot of people and, and talk to them again. I, this is going to be so, so much fun for me. Yeah, that would be great. John, uh, you didn't mention that right now the Armenians are facing another genocide. No, I did not. And if um, uh, if people aren't paying attention to that, it's uh, and if Mark's on the line, he can he probably can explain it better than I do. But roughly speaking, there was there's an area next to the Republic of Armenia that is in dispute over the years, and uh, right now there's been a there's been a, a, a war of sorts, a battle uh, between the uh, Armenian people who live in this district and the people of uh, Azerbaijani and, and they're Muslim and they're backed by Turkey. And they have now forced the Armenians out of a good part of their ancestral homes. They've had to leave in droves. There are, there are videos of them leaving in caravans and, and burning their homes as they leave uh, because they were going to lose the, the war with this other, other country because the other country was backed by the weapons and money of Turkey. Which So it's the, it's the old story that doesn't go away. Yeah, sad but true. Did that, Mark, if you're there, do you want to add to that? That's it in a nutshell, John. Uh, unfortunately, uh, it's a very, very bad situation. And uh, as you say, the, the war uh, did not go well. And the, and the people, the Armenians who are living in that area of Nagorno-Karabakh uh, face a very, uh, very uncertain future at best. And um, whether they'll be able to continue to live there at all, I, I think is, is somewhat in doubt. And, uh, you know, there aren't many Armenia is a small country, and, and this area that we're talking about is even smaller still. Uh, so to lose any amount of, of land that is inhabited by Armenians is, is a terrible blow. And, and it, you know, with, with, everything, with, the, with the pandemic and the election stuff and all that, this story is not made page one very often. Right. But if you if you if you pay attention and go into page five and six of the newspaper or your website, you will you will find coverage. The stories are there. They are the, the New York Times has done some pretty good pieces. Mark, you think? Some of them have been. Yeah. 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 It's not. It, it should be a little bit bigger news because it's quite a tragedy. But if you if you look a little bit, you'll find the stories about it in the news. Yeah. Um. The New York Times has covered it quite well, and the mm -hmm. Russians are now getting involved in that. Not too deeply yet, but we'll wait and see what happens from there. Right, they're a peacekeeping force there, but 
we'll, we'll see how much they want to get involved if things start going bad again. Right. I happen to have traveled there as well. Wow. Um, when I went to Armenia, I also went to Azerbaijan, and I have since also been to Turkey. So I've seen quite a bit of that area, and it's never been the friendliest place near the country lines. You're quite a brave traveler, Nancy. Yeah, I've been very fortunate. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, everybody. It was so wonderful to hear everybody's voices and uh, other stories that they shared with John and growing up in Dover. Um, I'll, I'll, put, any... I'll put a plug in for the book, Susan. The book is available at the library. Yep. Uh, yep. The, uh, the new little bookstore on Upper Central Ave, is that still open? Freethinkers Bookstore? Yep. yep. They, they're carrying the book and it's on, uh, it's on Amazon Prime or from the publisher, uh, Glad Suite Publishing at New Hampshire uh, Booksellers. And the Nasser Bookstore. And the Nasser Bookstore. <laughs> yeah. Good for you, Mark. <laughs> uh, thanks, Steve. Wonderful. <laughs> hey, John. All right. Hey, John, just as a side note, um, my son last year married a uh, an Armenian girl from Florida. All right. And... Uh, so uh, just just to let you know that the uh, the Irish Armenian connection in Dover is uh, is uh, still uh, at hand. That is fantastic. I didn't know that, Kevin. Fabulous. Good. Well, hopefully I'll meet everybody one of these days again, and I love to do that. Sounds good. Yeah. All right. Well, thank, thank you, you so much, thank John. You. Thank you, Mark. Thank you for everybody's contributions. It was a wonderful program, and uh, I did Perfect. record it so. Um, Mark prompted me to do that, so we'll try to get it up um, somewhere. So um, the people that didn't sign up that didn't make it uh, can enjoy it as well. And again, John's book is for sale and in town and available in the library. So um, we're so grateful. Thank you so much, John. Thank you, Susan. Yeah. All right, yeah, and we'll definitely have you here when uh, life Person. returns to normal. It would be great. Yes, thank that'd you. be great. All right, thank you, you everybody. Thank you. Have a thank good you. evening. Bye, thank you. All right. Bye-bye.